grasshoppers, caterpillars, ants, beetles, mealworms. Sound appetizing? On today's episode, we evaluate the pros and cons of making insects a dietary staple. We'll discuss the current practice of entomophagy, the nutritional profile of some insects, and the environmental impact of a change to a more insectful diet. I'm Professor Megan. I'm Professor Susan. And we're your Your nutrition nutrition profs. profs. We are registered dietitians and college professors who have taught more than 10,000 students about health and nutrition. We have answered a lot of questions about nutrition over the years. Some questions we get asked every year, and some are rarely asked, but very interesting. We are here to share our answers to these common and uncommon nutrition questions with you. So bring your curiosity and let's get started. Welcome Welcome to to our class. Welcome, everyone. This is our fifth episode. Can you believe it, Megan? Wow, that's amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who is listening to our podcast. Your ratings and reviews are so helpful, and we love hearing from you. Absolutely. We love it. Keep giving us your feedback. You know, it's like getting student evaluations at the end of each class. (laughs) Yes, it is. It helps us know what you like about the podcast and what can be improved. So thank you and keep them coming. All right, Megan. So let's get into it. What's our topic today? What question are we answering? Okay, I have a good one. It may not be one of the most commonly asked questions, but it definitely comes up in class. Should we be eating insects? Ooh, that is a good one. Yeah. And typically a student will bring it up or it may come up as an offshoot when we're talking about sources of protein. And someone will usually say like, I heard that insects like crickets are actually some of the best sources of protein. Is that really true? Yeah, (laughs) it's true. (laughs) And of course, the majority of the class has a fairly poor reaction to the yes. idea of eating insects, right? Like they'll make comments, gross, I can never eat bugs, or that's so nasty. Exactly, which of course requires me to say something about how while eating insects is not a common occurrence here in the U.S., many other cultures have and continue to consume insects regularly. So let's get into the history of entomophagy or the practice of eating bugs. Sciency word, entomophagy. Yes. I have to admit that I'm usually pretty open to most foods, but I'm really not too excited about eating insects. I'm less open than you are, unfortunately, (laughs) and I am also not excited about this. But we are going to dip our toes into the insect eating pool later in the episode. Really, the kitty pool. The kitty pool. (laughs) But first, let's share what we've found. Insects have been part of the human diet for thousands of years. References in the Old Testament of the Bible, specifically in Leviticus, encourage consumption of locusts, katydids, crickets, and grasshoppers. And St. John the Baptist was said to have survived on locusts and honey in the desert. There is evidence that Native American communities consumed several types of insects, including crickets, caterpillars, ants, and aphids. And the ancient Romans and Greeks wrote about loving beetle larvae and cicada nymphs. Although nearly 2,000 insect species are edible, according to the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, or FAO, the most commonly eaten insect groups are, and I quote, beetles, caterpillars, bees, wasps, ants, grasshoppers, locusts, crickets, cicadas, leaf and plant hoppers, scale insects and true bugs, termites, dragonflies, and flies. Wow, that's a lot. (laughs) That's a lot for being the most common. Right. Well, 2,000 insect species are edible. That's that's kind of a significant number. A lot more than I would have thought. Definitely. Many cultures regularly forage for edible insects, and they're a regular part of the diet for an estimated 2 billion, with a B, people in more than 80 countries, primarily in Asia, Africa, and South America. That's about a fourth or a quarter of the total world population. Entomophagy occurs throughout Africa, particularly when other sources of food are scarce, like during the rainy season from June to August. In the Central African Republic, during this time, the rainy season, consumption of caterpillars increases up to 42 per person per day, and they usually smoke or dry them. In Ghana, winged termites are collected 
and then they're fried, roasted, or made into bread. Oh. And in South Africa, termites are added to cornmeal porridge. Indigenous people of Central and South America consume several different types and amounts of insects depending on availability, with some insects accessible year-round, while others may be only in season for a few months, like you mentioned, and perhaps considered more as a delicacy. Hmm. Silkworms, grasshoppers, and crickets are common snacks in Thailand, Vietnam, and South Korea. And don't forget, there's that agave worm in bottles of mezcal liquor from Mexico. That's right. (laughs) And you know, I decided to look into this as part of my research for this episode. So it's actually not a worm, but the caterpillar of the agave red worm moth. Hmm, Interesting. Legend has it that if the worm was still wriggling when it hit the bottom of the bottle, that it was safe to drink. (laughs) But if the worm died on the way down to throw the batch out. Oh, Okay. (laughs) (laughs) There are even myths out there about it containing hallucinogenic properties if you eat the worm. I've heard that. I've heard that too, but none of it is true. Oh. Um, It also supposedly enhances the flavor and color of the liquor, but from what I found, the worm is mostly just a marketing gimmick. Oh, that's too bad. (laughs) (laughs) But back to entomophagy. With so many parts of the world eating insects, why don't we as Americans consume them? Well, we do actually consume some or at least parts of some insects, but not necessarily on purpose. (laughs) It's actually regulated by the FDA. For example, the FDA allows up to 75 insect parts per half cup of flour. And for every quarter cup of cornmeal, FDA allows one or more whole insects, oh. two or more rodent hairs, oh. and 50 or more insect fragments. Oh, fragments. I don't know why that sounds worse. That sounds bad. <laughs> than a whole insect. Well, I guess not. I don't know. <laughs> it's estimated that every year we may eat as much as two pounds of insect fragments through our processed food. Oh, no. And if you think about honey... Honey's delicious. <laughs> it's not actually consumption of insects, but one teaspoon of honey has the equivalent of the lifetime regurgitations of 50 bees. Interesting or gross, depending <laughs> on your perspective. I always forget that sweet honey is actually just bee vomit. Oh, when you put it that way. <laughs> It's really not surprising that most Americans have an ick factor, including us, when it comes to insects. Yeah. I mean, we're taught as kids that bugs are bad, right? They're dirty and they're dangerous. Don't don't eat that. Don't put that in your mouth. Don't pick that up. We do things to reduce the number of bugs in our environment. We put pesticides on our crops and I hire an exterminator to come to my house and get rid of the cockroaches. So culturally, I think we've been a little biased towards not eating insects. That's so true. Because insects are not a traditional food in our culture, there's actually this sometimes this feeling of superiority to those who consume bugs. Anthropologists call this ethnocentric bias. For example, Christopher Columbus called locals beasts for eating snakes, lizards, spiders, and worms. Yeah, I think I think that's human nature to well, exactly. It's to look down on people who don't do things the same way you do, which is not fair, but I think it's just part of being human. Yeah. So once a culture rejects something, it's easily passed on from parent to offspring, but that may not be forever. Let's talk about the lobster. Mm. Lobsters and shrimp used to be considered dirty and called the cockroaches of the sea. (laughs) I didn't know that. (laughs) In colonial times, there was such an abundance of lobster that it was reported to have piled up two feet high in places on the northeastern coast. And it was actually called a poor man's food. I can't even imagine two feet of lobster on the beach just laying there. Oh my gosh. Lobster was so inexpensive at that time, it was canned and served to railway travelers that are unfamiliar with it. So these non-coastal travelers loved it. (laughs) They considered it delicious and exotic. And then during World War II, lobster was not rationed like so many other meats. So people of all social backgrounds were exposed to it and realized its deliciousness. 
and it became the expensive delicacy we have today. It is expensive. (laughs) And it took several years before people living in the Northeast decided that it was okay to eat. But now if you travel there, you'll pay a pretty penny for those cockroaches of the Mm -hmm. sea. So perhaps in 100 years, crickets will be a mainstay of the American diet or at least a delicacy for special occasions like lobster. What do you think? It could happen. You know, it may have to happen. As of November 2022, the world's population reached 8 billion people. And it's predicted to reach almost 10 billion by 2050. That's a lot of people to feed. And so that's going to have a huge environmental impact. There could be scarcities of land, water, forest, fisheries, and non-renewable energy because of the population growth. Yeah. It's estimated that raising livestock uses about 70% of the total land used for all agriculture. 70%. 70%. And it's the cause of nearly 20% of human-induced greenhouse gas. If we farmed insects instead, we could use up to 90% less land and produce about 100 times fewer greenhouse gas emissions than conventional livestock. 100 times fewer. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. There's another way to look at this. Crickets require 12 times less feed than cattle, four times less feed than sheep, and half as much feed as pigs and broiler chickens to produce the same amount of protein. 100 pounds of feed produces 10 pounds of beef, but 45 pounds of crickets. And one pound of beef requires 2,000 gallons of water. But one pound of crickets only requires one gallon of water. And if we ate the pests that damage our crops, instead of trying to kill them with pesticides, that could also benefit our environment. All right. So there are definitely clear environmental and cost benefits. We would use less land, less feed, less water, and we would create fewer greenhouse gases. But what about nutrition? How do insects stack up? Well, the answer is like so many things in nutrition, it It depends. depends. (laughs) There are so many different types of insects resulting in a wide variety of nutrient profiles. And the life stage of the insect, such as whether it's a larvae, a pupae, or an adult, as well as the insect's diet can also really greatly influence this. A large study of 236 edible insects found that most provide satisfactory amounts of energy and protein, and are high in unsaturated fatty acids. Mm. That's the kind we want more of. Definitely the good stuff. When compared to animal meat, for example, hamburger is roughly 18% protein and 18% fat, while grasshopper is 60% protein and just 6% fat. Wow, that is a big difference. That is a big difference. The grasshopper provides more than 230% more protein and 65% less fat. That is huge. Huge. Insects can provide several vitamins and minerals as well. It varies greatly, like Megan said earlier, based on the place in the life cycle of the insect, but many provide several minerals, including copper, magnesium, manganese, phosphorus, selenium, zinc, and especially iron. Iron in insects has been found to match or exceed the amount of iron provided by beef. And that's huge because iron deficiency anemia is the most common nutrient deficiency in the world. Right. You know, almost 75% of women are iron deficient. Yeah. Several vitamins are also provided by insects. For example, caterpillars are especially high in B vitamins, while pupae, or immature bees, are a great source of vitamins A and D. And the red palm weevil is an excellent source of vitamin E. Another interesting fact is that insects also provide some dietary fiber, but you have to eat the exoskeleton. The exoskeleton, so you've got to eat the whole bug probably, the or well, bug. I guess it would be ground up. The exoskeleton contains chitin, and chitin is an insoluble fiber. This is really unique among animal foods because no other animal food has fiber. Yeah. We could use insects as food for not just humans, 
but we could also use them for animal feed. I mean, my dog Baxter, he already eats bugs. <laughs> he'll catch a cicada or, you know, it'll buzz in his mouth and eventually he'll <laughs> crunch down on it. Or just last night, some bug was flying by and he opened his mouth and he snatched it out of the air and he swallowed it. So I think my dog would love it if there were insects in his dog food. This could greatly benefit the environment. Insects can feed on bio waste and turn it into high quality protein that could be fed to animals. It's a win-win. So a group of USDA scientists are actually trapping mosquitoes and flies that are abundant on most farms and ranches and then using those trapped insects as chicken feed instead of the typical soy-based feed that is being used now. The chickens seem to love eating the mosquitoes. We've posted a link to a short video on our website that you can see for yourselves just how much they like it. It's actually a really cute video. <laughs> so <laughs> and check, very short. <laughs> check it out at yournutritionprofs.com. And not only do the chickens seem to like eating the insects, which makes sense because that's part of their natural diet, but the egg yolks are also yellower, they're higher in micronutrients, and the eggs taste different, better, like those of backyard chickens. So if they can get these traps figured out and make them cost effective, this would be a great way to add higher quality protein and nutrients to animal feed and reduce the use of pesticides on farms, which lowers waste, CO2 emissions, and other environmental contaminants. So if farmers can trap the insects that already live on their farms, that not only saves them money, it seems to be better for the livestock too, and for the people who are around there, because if you've ever been on a farm, there are a lot of flies. (laughs) (laughs) So as we've mentioned, insects can be consumed in a variety of forms. Traditionally, they are consumed whole, roasted, fried, dried, or even raw, depending on the type of insect. But due to the ick factor that so many people have for eating bugs in in America, Mm -hmm. they are now being pulverized and added to products like flours and cornmeal. So people may be more likely to try bugs in something like flour as it may provide a sense of sterilization and cleanliness due to the processing. And no legs. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I think bug legs are the worst. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And this may be the best way to start the bug eating revolution. You know, I've heard that ants and termites taste sweet, almost a little bit nutty, and aquatic insects taste like fish. Have you heard that? I I haven't heard about the the aquatic ones, but I've definitely heard about the nuttiness of ants. Mm. But according to the book Creepy Crawly Cuisine, the gourmet guide to edible insects, larvae of wood-destroying beetles tastes like fatty brisket. (laughs) That is crazy. I'd almost want to try that. I do want to try it just to see if it really does. And and cockroaches are supposed to taste like mushrooms. Mm. Mealy bugs taste like fried potatoes. I like fried potatoes. I could get behind that. And then wasps taste like pine nuts. Pine nuts. My gosh, pine nuts are so expensive. I think I might have to give wasps a try the next time I need some pine nuts. It's crazy. Yeah. We posted a link to this book in our show notes. Check it out. You know, there's something we haven't discussed yet. Are there any risks to eating insects? Well, just as nutrient density varies amongst so many different species of insects, so do possible risks. When insects are consumed whole, meaning their guts and all, we don't fully know how that impacts the food safety risk for the consumer. That makes sense. Yeah. Risk seems low, but insects can harbor pathogens such as viruses, bacteria, parasites. So to reduce the risk of this foodborne illness from insects, it's recommended to roast or fry them instead of eating them raw, just like we do with meats. Mm. And then of course, follow the same best practices when processing, storing, and preparing food. Clean, separate, cook, and chill. And the guys will be doing a future episode on food safety in the future. So stay tuned. Another thing to consider is the possibility of an allergic reaction. Insects and crustaceans, like the lobsters we (laughs) talked about before, they belong to the arthropod family. And those who have an allergy to shellfish may also be at greater risk of an allergic response to some edible insects. But like a lot of things, we need more research. So where are we today with edible insects? In 2018, the market value of edible insects was estimated to be about $306 million, but that number is 
definitely expected to increase as the population increases to meet global demands for food. Some economists believe the market will grow to over $8 billion in the not-so-distant future. That's a huge increase. Yeah, that's that's a lot. That's a lot. Well, in 2021, the European Union officially certified frozen, dried, or powdered forms of crickets, mealworms, and grasshoppers as safe for human consumption. And this has greatly increased insect farming in the EU, but it hasn't happened yet in the U.S., We've posted another video in the show notes about insect farming, specifically in France, to feed farm animals, pets, and people. So check it out. In the U.S., regulation of edible insects is sorely lacking. FDA has only limited regulation of insects and only as contaminants in food like we discussed earlier, the insect fragments fragments. in in flour and cornmeal. It has not officially approved insects for human consumption like the EU has but it hasn't prohibited them either. So it categorizes them as food, and they must be processed using what they call good manufacturing practices, but those really haven't been defined either. It does allow edible insects and insect-derived foods to be imported to the United States. So you can find chocolate-covered crickets, beetle soup, insect flowers like cricket flour, those uh, lollipops. Oh, yeah, the lollipops with like the the um, spider or the uh, scorpion yes, in them. Yes, yes. So those are fine to import. They're not stopping that from happening. So you can have access to insect-derived foods. Since COVID-19 and the EU certification, there has been a lot more pressure put on the FDA to differentiate between insects as filth or adulterants and insects as food, but we'll see what happens. That's a pretty big leap from yeah. filth to food. <laughs> so before we end up with insects on our Thanksgiving plate, mm. there are still barriers in place regarding the implementation of widespread entomophagy. We need mass production technologies developed to meet demands. We need more research into the safety and allergen factors of consuming insects. And we need more data regarding the nutritional value. And we can't forget, consumer acceptance of entomophagy remains one of the biggest obstacles. Oh, most definitely. That ick factor is tough to get over. Yeah, but all is not lost. (laughs) A 2022 study of over 3,000 respondents from several countries, including the U.S., examined the acceptance of whole or visible mealworms and processed mealworms. The results showed that those from Mexico and China were more accepting of both the whole and the processed mealworms, but Mexico and China both have a history of entomophagy. So So it makes total sense that they would be more accepting. Those from Europe and the U.S. were less likely to eat mealworms in any form. Yeah, also understandable. (laughs) And the reasons for this um, include just disgust, concern for possible risk, and the science-y word food neophobia, which is a fear of trying new food. Mm. Participants younger than 42 years old and male-identifying respondents were more accepting of the mealworms. So that bodes well for the future. Yes. Younger people are more open. Yeah. And maybe not surprisingly, the processed version of mealworms were identified as more acceptable than, than the whole mealworms. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would I would think that yeah. was true across the board. Yeah. <laughs> I would definitely be more likely to eat an insect that's ground up yeah. and not visible. But there's still a lot of disdain for eating insects in Western countries. Yeah, like I said before, when the topic of eating insects comes up, it's the response is not great. <laughs> it's not good. So have you ever knowingly eaten insects, Megan? No, I have not. The cultural aversion to it is quite strong with me. Um, and I'm really not excited about the sensation of a bug leg in my mouth. Yeah, I'm not really either, but... We're going to. (laughs) We're going to start small. So we have made two types of chocolate chip cookies, one batch made with traditional all-purpose wheat flour and the other made with cricket flour. Cricket flour is much more nutrient-dense than wheat flour. It has almost six times more protein, twice the fiber, eight times the calcium, 30% more iron, and 12 times more potassium than wheat flour. And insect protein is considered complete. It contains all of the essential amino acids required for human growth and development. Oh, yeah, because it's an animal. Exactly. 
unlike plant flowers, insect flower contains cholesterol. Mm, again, it's an animal. Yeah. And it's usually higher in sodium. Also, insects wouldn't be appropriate for a vegetarian or a vegan diet. We've got a table in the show notes showing the nutrient differences between cricket flower and AP flower. So take a look at our website, yournutritionprofs.com. We made cookies out of a chirps, not sponsored, <laughs> cricket cookie mix. We were going to just buy some cricket flour, but we couldn't find anything small enough. For yeah, us it was like cookies. 20 pounds or yeah, something, like we're, 12 pounds. Uh, Maybe it wasn't that much. But it was a lot. It was a lot. We were trying to figure out how we would use it all up. So instead, from a company called Chirps, we bought chocolate chip cricket cookie mix, and we made cookies from that. Now, according to the package, there are 20 crickets per cookie. Oh my. Or the equivalent of 20 <laughs> crickets per cookie. And they say that uh, cricket protein is the most sustainable, complete protein with a subtle and deliciously nutty flavor. Okay. They also say that cricket protein has more B12 than salmon, more iron than spinach, and as we mentioned before, all nine essential amino acids because it's an animal food. Yeah. There is also a disclaimer on here that it contains shellfish and wheat. And if you have crustacean shellfish allergies, you may also be sensitive to crickets. So that's good that they have that on the label. So I'm looking at the the cookies in front of us and I see, oh, we also made just a regular um, Nestle dark chocolate Toll House cookies, just to kind of compare. And I'm looking and the cricket flour, the chirp cookie is definitely darker. It's like oh, dark brown. Significantly darker. Yeah. And not because we burned them. <laughs> no. <laughs> we made them perfectly. They were actually darker as dough. And we actually took a picture. We'll post which, that which on we'll the... We'll post on the site so you can see the different colors of the dough. The darker dough is cricket flour and the lighter dough is Toll House. Yep. Regular cookies. All right, Megan, you ready? I am. Let's do it. All right, here we go. Okay. Cricket cookie. I feel like I can definitely taste kind of something. Yeah, but it's good. No, it's really good. It's almost a little... I'm not even sure how to describe it. I don't know. But it's tasty. I'm having another bite. Yeah. And we need to compare them to the regular cookies. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. So Toll House. I can't really tell much difference. I can't either. So other than the color. Yeah. They're pretty good. They're pretty good. I'll, I will definitely eat more. Yeah, definitely. Okay. But we also <laughs> we also have dark chocolate crickets with amaranth seeds that we bought. <laughs> and they're, it's from a company called Don Bugito. <laughs> Out of San Francisco. <laughs> and it says that... Our handmade dark chocolate crickets are fully toasted crickets covered in fair trade dark chocolate and sprinkled with toasted amaranth. Okay. And the first ingredient is toasted crickets. And the second ingredient is amaranth seeds. (laughs) They are sodium free. They have a little bit of fiber, a little bit of protein, a little bit of iron. And a lot of saturated fat, but that's because of the chocolate, yeah, I think. <laughs> so, And you can see the seeds in it. Like, yeah, You can see the seeds in the chocolate. All right, you ready? Uh-huh. Here we go. Let's do it. Can't tell there are crickets in it. No. Well. I need to bite it in half. I don't know. Can you tell? There's like a little bit of an aftertaste. It's not bad. I mean, I'm not saying it's bad. I almost think the amaranth seeds are a little bit off-putting. Mm. Because my big thing is the whole like leg and obviously we don't see any legs or anything it's all ground up right but crunching into it is making me like oh yeah that's a bug it's not but yeah i suspect that they ground up the crickets yeah added it basically to chocolate and then covered it in amaranth seeds so honestly i'd eat these again too yeah i mean i would if it's thick i don't know if i'd Get on Amazon and buy them, but maybe. <laughs> they are expensive. They oh, oh, yes, they were. <laughs> Definitely expensive. This was a pretty tame way oh, yeah. to, to stick our toe in the water mm-hmm. and try some crickets. Yeah. I think we need to be bolder next time. Next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Megan, so what's the bottom line on eating insects? Insects are a sustainable food source and should be considered a way to address issues such as food security and climate change. They're higher in protein, lower in fat than traditional meats. 
They contain a number of micronutrients that are critical for human well-being, and they require significantly less feed and water to provide the same amount of nutritional value as other protein sources, which saves a substantial amount of energy and natural resources. And the reproduction rate of insects is much higher, so that'd be easier to raise. But like most things, more research is needed to find answers about nutritional quality, food safety, and allergens. You know, we also don't know what farming insects on a mass scale would look like. What are good farming, manufacturing, and processing standards? What regulations or policy decisions would need to be made by FDA, USDA, or other groups? Would they have inspections like they do for feedlots and eggs? Which insects would be approved for human versus animal feed? We can learn a lot from the EU and insect producing industries there, I think, and also from countries where they already consume a lot of insects. Absolutely. I think most Americans would be on board with using insects, particularly in animal feed, like for pet foods, and maybe as additives to staples like flour or cornmeal. But the biggest unanswered question of all is, would Americans eat the actual insects? Would it be culturally acceptable? And only time will tell. I mean, I would say with the flour, the cricket flour, you couldn't even tell that it no, was cricket flour. No, you and can't. if it's higher in protein and it's better for the environment, I would say the only downside to cricket flour is how expensive it is. But I would think that the cost would come down as it becomes more acceptable. As it becomes more acceptable, and then once we have those farming practices in place, because crickets can reproduce so quickly. Right, right. It's just we have to have the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And then the cost, I think, would be much lower. Most definitely. Well, that's it for our discussion on entomophagy. Thanks for joining us. We really enjoyed this episode, and not just because we got to eat cookies. (laughs) So eating insects may be difficult for many of us, but it's worth considering that with population growth and the planet's resources, we'll not be able to support diets high in animal protein. And insects might be part of the solution. If you get a chance to try some insects, let us know about your experience. Send us an email to yournutritionprofs at gmail.com or on our Instagram at yournutritionprofs. That brings us to the end of today's episode. Join us next time where we'll tell you all about the beautiful dragon fruit. Class Class dismissed. dismissed. this episode you can find the show notes and a list of sources on our website yournutritionprofs.com your homework is to follow us at your nutrition profs on instagram and to listen to our next episode you can listen on amazon prime apple Podcasts, spotify or anywhere podcasts are found we'd appreciate it if you'd like us write a review subscribe and invite your family and friends to join us too If you have a nutrition or health question you'd like answered, let us know. We may do a show about it. Send an email to yournutritionprofs at gmail.com or click on the Contact Us page on our website. Thanks to Brian Pittman for creating our artwork. You can find him on Instagram at brianpittman77. See you next time. time.